Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making the star, at the very least, on my uh, review of Talking Heads by Alan Bennett. So as always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and, and then I'll share an overall thought and rating at the end. So... Alan Bennett sealed his reputation as the master of observation with this series of 12 groundbreaking monologues, originally filmed for BBC television. Darkly comic, tragically poignant and wonderfully uplifting, Talking Heads is widely regarded as a modern classic. This new edition, which contains the complete collection of Talking Heads as well as his earlier monologue, A Woman of No Importance, is a celebration of Alan Bennett's finest work. So I thought this little bit here was quite interesting. Uh, Mr. Penry Jones is very proud of my scar. He fetches his students round to see it nearly every week. He says he's never seen a scar heal as quickly as mine. It's to do with the right mental attitude, apparently. They stop longer at my bed than with anybody. What he does is take the students a bit away, talks to them quietly, then they come up one by one and ask me questions. I whisper to them, he doesn't know what it is, so don't worry if you don't. Mrs. Durant on this side, she won't have them. She goes on about patients' rights. She's a school teacher, though you'd never guess it to look at her. Long hair, masses of it. And I've heard her swear when they've given her a jab. Yeah, somebody was telling me about Rill. Still very select, apparently. No crowds. I have a friend from uh, Rill. In the introduction here, um, he talks about <laughs> repetitiveness, basically. He says, I am disturbed, as I was with a previous collection of television plays, to note so many repetitions and recurrences. There are droves of voluntary workers, umpteen officials from the social services, and should there be a knock on the door, it's most likely to be a bearded vicar. Even Emily Bronte turns up twice. If I'm guilty of repeating myself, on another count I plead innocence. The suspicion of child abuse in A Lady of Letters and the hint of it in Soldiering On might suggest I am straining after topicality. My instinct is generally to take flight in the opposite direction, and in fact both these pieces were written and recorded before the subject began regularly to hit the headlines, which it may well have ceased to do by the time the programmes are transmitted. Since several of the characters fare badly at the hands of social and community workers, I might seem to be taking a currently fashionable line here also. In the popular press nowadays, social workers are generally, and easily, abused. I have little experience of them, and to seem to line up with the Sun or the Daily Express would dismay me. My quarrel with social work is not with its praiseworthy practicalities, but with the jargon in which it's sometimes conducted. Graham's, I am not being defensive about sexual intercourse, she is my mother, is a protest about language. I like this little bit of dialogue here, um, he says, um, She and dozens like her have auditioned for films and plays I've done in the last 20 years. One of the first Leslie-like characters was a boy who came up for a part in 40 years on. The director asked him what he had done. I was in George Bernard Shaw. What did you play? The drums. We get this bit here. Um, Graham doesn't care, do you, Graham, Mother said. He reads a lot. So what, Mr. Turnbull said. I know several big readers who still manage to be men about town. And Mr. Turnbull says, I think the solution to mental illness is hard physical work. I thought this was... Um, an interesting sort of thing I've never really thought about before. One of the unsolved mysteries of life, or the unsolved mysteries of my life, is why the vicar's wife is expected to go to church at all. A barrister's wife doesn't have to go to court. An actor's wife isn't at every performance. So why have I always got to be on parade? Not to mention the larger question of whether one believes in God in the first place. It's assumed that being the vicar's wife one does, but the question has never actually come up. Not with Geoffrey, anyway. I can understand why, of course. To look at me, the hair, the flat chest, the one smile, you'd think I was just cut out for God, and maybe I am. It's just like, I'd just like to have been asked, that's all. Not that it matters, of course. So long as you can run a tight jumble cell, you can believe in what you like. And then the communion wine goes missing, and uh, he writes, It's on the tip of my tongue to say that if Jesus is all he's cracked up to be, why doesn't he just use tap water and put it up to the test? And then they remember that they have some cough mixture, and they switch it out for that, and nobody notices. Um, in A Lady of Letters, um... Basically, somebody dies, and um, she says, um, they didn't write back, which I can understand, because the one thing death always entails is a mass of correspondence. Still true, I would say. A Lady of Letters, I thought was quite interesting, just because it kind of focuses on um, this lady who likes to write complaints letters, basically, and we all know someone like that. And I thought this was great. Uh, this is Her Big Chance, uh, starring Julie Waters as Leslie. And so this is the opening line of the monologue. I shot a man last week, in the back. I miss it now, it was really interesting. Still, I'm not going to get depressed about it. You have to look to the future. To have something like that under your belt can be quite useful. You never know when you might be called on to repeat the experience. And then we discover why she shot, shot someone in the back. Um, which I guess is kind of spoiler territory. So we get this bit here. Um, I said it's a relief to find someone civil. He said, it's the usual story, Leslie. Art comes in at the door, manners go out the window. Why is making a film like being a mushroom? 
I said, why, Terry? He said, they keep you in the dark and every now and again somebody comes and throws a bucket of shit over you. Uh, so here in, in the introduction to Talking Heads 2, Bennett says, uh, just as in the first series of Talking Heads there was only one male monologue and five by women. After that series, a viewer wrote to me suggesting that if I wrote a series wholly for men, I could call it Talking Balls, which, had I been able to write six male monologues, I would happily have done. That I can't, I put down to the fact that when I was a child, the women did most of the talking, so that I've been more attuned to the discourse of women than to that of men. And though such real-life monologues I come across nowadays are generally in the mouths of men, I don't find male talk easy to reproduce. Though it's easier when the men are damaged, as Wilfred is in playing sandwiches and Graham in a chip in the sugar. Here in uh, The Hand of God, there's a woman who sort of buys and sells stuff, basically. And I thought, I thought this was interesting because this is kind of, I guess, what I've been doing on my eBay store. It's like Scrabble, my dear. Start saving up for the big one, the seven letter word, and you're done for. Get your letters down, five pound here, ten pound there. Buy for X one week, sell for Y the next. That's how you make your money. Look well in a boardroom, or one of those loft conversion things. Uh, so we have the outside dog where basically, um, you know, this woman's paying for the crime that her husband, I believe it was, committed. So it's like people are posting dog poo through a letterbox and stuff. As we get this bit, reporter, reporter comes ringing the doorbell this afternoon. I think they must take it in turns. Shouts through the letterbox. I said, you want to be careful with that letterbox. You don't know what's been through it. Says I'm sitting on a gold mine. Talks about £10,000, my side of the story. And now uh, this is the start of waiting for the telegram and I just thought this was quite amusing. I saw this fella's what you call it today, except I'm not supposed to, except I'm not supposed to say what you call it. Verity says, Violet, what you call it is banned. When we cannot find the word we want, we describe. We do not say what you call it. Well, you won't catch me describing that. Besides, what you call it is what I call it. Somebody's what you call it. Anyway, I saw it. I didn't think anything about it, only somebody must have gone and alerted the police because next thing you know, bouncing Betty pulls in. She says, Violet, I have to ask you this. Was the penis erect? I said, Nurse Bapti. That's not a word I would use. She said, erect? I said, no, the other. She said, well, Violet, you've had what we call a stroke. You're sometimes funny with words. I said, I'm not funny with that word. She said, things have changed now, Violet. Penis is its name. All the other names are just trying to make it more acceptable. Language is a weapon, Violet. We're at war. I said, who with? She said, men. And uh, we also get somebody, uh, a reference to somebody golloping their food. And I haven't heard that word for so long. I thought, I think it might be quite a Midlandsy thing to say, oh, he's golloping his food down. But yeah, it's kind of fun to see that, you know? I like this line. He looked a bit snotty, but I said, Bernard, nobody ever learned to talk again by watching the snooker. I like the snooker. So yeah, overall, Talking Heads by Alan Bennett. It was kind of a disappointment to me, just because I think I'd hyped it up so much. I knew it was super influential for Charlie, of, uh, Charlie Heathcote here on Booktube. And I know that without this book, his R. Doris books wouldn't exist. Honestly, I preferred R. Doris to this, um, but I think the reason is this is very much written specifically with television in mind. Um, I think in some cases he probably even knew the actors and actresses that he wanted to play the roles. And so I just don't think it necessarily carries over that well in the book. I think you might as well just watch the TV series, which I have not done. And now I feel as though I don't need to, but I feel like if you're going to just watch one of them, you know, or read one of them, Go for the the actual series because I think that's much more true to what Bennett would have envisioned it as. Um, here it almost feels a bit lazy that they've just sort of took the scripts and just published them. Basically, um, it doesn't really hold up on its own as a, as a book. I think it really only works when you have the context of it as a TV series. But yeah. There we have it, that's what I thought of Talking Heads by Alan Bennett. I gave this one like a 3.25 out of 5 maybe. Uh, I'm glad I've read it. That's about all I got for you. Um, I've de so I've definitely preferred Bennett's other stuff. Um, in particular, like The Lady in the Van and The Uncommon Reader for me. Both of those were like phenomenal. And then this is just, uh, um, this just feels like, it doesn't feel as here as though Bennett's like a, a novelist or a book writer or anything. It, it feels just like, again, um, I think the comparison I've made is like when they did a, a bit of Fry and Laurie book and they just published all of the scripts and it's just kind of, I mean, you can do that, but it's, you know, it doesn't feel like an original standalone piece of work by itself, I guess. So there we have it, that's what I made of Talking Heads by Alan Bennett. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.